Much as I love Christmas, the shops are not where I want to be at this time of year. Queuing, panicking and trying to find a parking space do not induce the seasonal spirit in me. So, cliched or not, I'm going back to basics. I want to find a way of celebrating Christmas that is less about shopping and more about enjoying. So this year, I'm making presents. Now, I haven't magic more hours in the day. I certainly don't want to turn my kitchen into a kind of conveyor belt. But time spent making effortless, homemade, mellow and spice chutneys, perfect presents, and my irresistible little Christmas poudini bonbons really is a kind of therapy in the middle of all this seasonal madness. I would so much rather be in the kitchen making presents than in the hell of the shops queuing up to buy them. And I have to say, although I'm not normally keen on the sort of picture pretty, I have been totally overwhelmed by the lure of the cute in the form of my Christmas Poudini bonbons. I mean, you can tell I've gone by the name I've given them. You start off with some cooked and cooled Christmas pudding. You can either buy a little one early, or you can breathe new life into last year's. Let's crumble that into a bowl. Now we need some dark chocolate. Let that melt while I pour over one of my favourite ingredients, some Pedro Jimenez. Pedro Jimenez, I think I've made it clear I'm not a Spanish speaker, is a particular grape variety and what it produces is a sherry that is so rich and raisiny and dark and treacly. Oh, look at it. If you don't get that, just use sweet sherry. Can't promise it'll be the same, but it'll still work. And then a small-ish amount of gorgeous oozy golden syrup. Let's stir this together. I have to say, if I were to attempt making you know, proper homemade sweets with sugar thermometers and boiling points and all that fandango, I'd go into a complete meltdown. But this is relaxingly easy. When this is stirred together, I will pour in the melted chocolate. Beautiful. So I just need to scrape this molten chocolate onto the pudding. And this, in effect, is the glue that sticks the bits of Christmas pudding together so that I can form my bulging baby Christmas poutini. Right, that's done. Now, to roll these out, I feel I am best advised to put on my CSI gloves. Never a hardship. And now, it is just a case of a roll em, roll em, roll em. In effect, what I'm trying to create here is that cannonball shape of original ye olde Christmas puddings, only in doll's house size. So these need to go in the fridge for a bit just to firm up. Meanwhile, I can get on with melting the white chocolate for the topping. Now these are ready to come into their own. The white chocolate has melted. And let a teeny bit dribble over the top. This is meant to look like that drippy icing on the top of Dickensian Christmas puddings. There we are, beautiful and snow-cat. And now I'm going to cut out some holly berries and leaves from these candied cherries. You will curse my name as you do this, I know. It's so sticky and fiddly. However, when you're done, you will thank me. So out of the red candied cherry, little holly berries, and now, out of the green candied cherries, I'm going to make some leaves. And although they look like miniature Christmas puddings, in fact, they taste rather more like fruity chocolate truffles. I mean, 
These babies have everything going for them. something so comforting about reading old cookery books especially books like these these are my stash of sort of chutney and jelly and pickling and preserving books I mean this one let's preserve it, it's a fantastic title in every way I bought at a second-hand bookshop at the coast of Cornwall oh, ages ago I mean but it's nearly as old as me and it cost 28 shillings at the time and actually preserving is so cosy just the idea of it things in jars things in cans and at this time of year particularly i think that idea of filling up shelves and hunkering down just makes you feel warmer and safer plus you know the thing about chutneys and jellies and all that is they do double duty because they make fantastic presents but also they are imperative for leftovers and my chili jelly i have to have you haven't had a leftover turkey sandwich worth its name really until you've had my chilli jelly with it. I mean, once you've peeled and chopped the peppers and chillies and just bung them in the processor, you're away. Mmm, beautiful. Right, you need jam sugar for this, that's the trick, that's what makes it easy. And jam sugar is simply sugar that's had pectin added. Look at that gorgeous snowy mountain. I mean, otherwise it is so much work and this makes it easy peasy. And on top of the sugar, some cider vinegar, splosh it in. I want the sugar to dissolve into the vinegar, but I think it's important not to stir because the whole point of the gorgeousness of the jelly is that it is clear. And now, time to add this incredible Christmas confetti. The colour seeps its way into the vinegar, so you end up with a coral jelly flecked with fiery crimson. OK, so whop up the heat, because I want this to come to a really rollicking boil. I mean, volcanically for about 10 minutes. I mean, it's wise to take a look at it every now and again because although I want fieriness and explosiveness, I don't want it to boil over. This is really hot stuff and boiled enough. Just going to let it cool a bit away from the hot ring, not just because it is piping, but because as this cools, those beautiful flecks of pepper will just disperse themselves evenly, which will really show and look lovely in their jars. You need sterilised jars, but don't panic. By sterilised, I mean jars that have been through the dishwasher cycle. The only important thing is you don't put your finger inside one and then de-sterilise it. And because I am quite clumsy, I think a jam funnel is in order. I don't trust myself to pour neatly, so I'm going to ladle it into these jars. Oh, so gorgeous. And the thing about this, well, like all preserves and chutneys, is that it really does double duty. Because not only is it a present that you want to give and that I'd want to receive, but as well, you have to keep some back because, for me, this is compulsory with Christmas leftovers. Well, this should keep the home fires burning over Christmas. There are some pickles I have to have in my store cupboard all year round, but some just say Christmas to me. And um, 
For many years, I had a godfather who would send me some crystallised ginger for Christmas. And I used to think, what kind of a present is this? But then when I got a bit older, I thought, well, you know, I could use it in cooking, and I did. And I started making my beetroot and ginger chutney. And now, frankly, it just makes my Christmas. And since I give it as presents as well, well, I like to think it makes other people's too. Anyway, it's very simple and straightforward to make. You just peel and chop cooking apples, fresh beetroot and red onion, and just tumble them all into a fairly large saucepan. Grate in some fresh ginger and chop up some of your crystallised ginger and add that too. The thing here is that the peppery warmth of both gingers really counters both the earthy sweetness of the beetroot and the sharpness of the apple. It makes the perfect chutney. So into this pan, sprinkle some soft light brown sugar, some salt and ground allspice. Pour over some red wine vinegar and just stir to mix. And only then do you turn the heat on. Let this come to a boil. Let it bubble for about an hour. Just stir every now and again. And after about that time, most of it will be mushy, but you'll still have a few chunks of beetroot and it'll be ready and simply pour into your warmed, sterilised pots and you should have enough to fill about six and you're done. Ten double espresso, please. Take away your drinking here. I'll have one here, the rest take away. Please have a seat, I will bring you your coffee and I need it. Other. I think it's safe to take these off now. So there are six of us for brunch and I've got a fairly big spread planned, not least because we need to absorb last night's excesses. Find your back. Ooh. It's very, very, very wow. hot. I've got my triple cheese and onion strata, which is a rather fantastic combination. Somewhere between a savoury bread and butter pudding and a cheese souffle. <laughs> I've also got my antioxidant fruit salad, much needed, I may say, and that's just mangoes cubed with blueberries and pomegranate seeds and just the spritz of lime, and it is fantastic. And it goes very well with my spruced up vanilla cake, which is an easy creation, but so sweet and rich and buttery, and I need a slice now. Now, I would be daunted by this, were it not for the fact that by some miracle, I had the presence of mind or presence of something, maybe not mind, to totter about and get the strata ready last night. Luckily, it's a very straightforward exercise. You just need a baking dish, and in it you layer some slices of bread. I like to use stale-ish baguette. And then in a processor, put a board of mozzarella, some parmesan and some cheddar along with a bunch of spring onions, some sour cream, six eggs, and blitz everything to mix. It's as simple as that. This instantly fixed cheese and egg sauce gets poured over the bits of bread in the dish. And just cling wrap the dish, put it in the fridge so everything can get absorbed overnight. And the next morning, all I have to do is take this out of the fridge and put it into the oven. handsomely revived now and ready to lurch into action, buoyed up by the prospect of my espresso martini. But first, I want to take the strata out of the fridge just so it comes to room temperature. Mm. 
Not bad, all things considered. Preheat the oven and I am ready for my spruced up vanilla cake. The spruced up refers really to the shape, so the tin does all the work. It's a very easy cake. You don't have to use a spray, I just as often pour some oil on some kitchen paper and smear it on. I quite enjoy this. And now, everything just goes in the processor. Modest amount of butter, whole packet, bar, maybe a piece of toast. It's a big cake though. 350 grams of plain flour. Sugar, 300 grams. Sprinkle it in. Many eggs, a whole packet of six. That's what makes it so rich and gorgeous and golden. I love it freshly sliced, but I have to say, if you put a slice in the toaster, it comes out almost like French toast, only you don't have to fry it. Vanilla, quite a lot, because it's that vanilliness that makes the cake so distinctive. Mm. And some bicarb. Not a lot, otherwise you get that soapy flavour. But the reason I'm using bicarb and not baking powder is hugely scientific and I won't go into it, not just because it's the morning, but it's because I've got some natural yoghurt, half a tub. The yoghurt makes the sponge incredibly tender. And now a blitz and the batter is made. Ah, oh, what a beautiful batter. Perfectly plain, but anything but austere. I mean, you can get about 20 slices out of this, so don't fret. Now, there are lots of nooks and crannies you can see in a tin like this, but it will come out. Just have to coax the sides of the cake a little with your fingers about 15 minutes after it's come out of the oven. Ah, oh, look at this gorgeous, oozing buttercup yellow. I've got a sheet in the oven which will help should there be any spills, not that I'm expecting any. So that's it, ready to be baked. The cake needs around an hour in the oven until it's cooked through and golden. While it cools, I get on with my fruit salad. Simply mix diced mango, blueberries and some pomegranate seeds with a spritz of lime. Finally, of course, the strata needs half an hour and you're about there. Right, my cake is cooked and cooled. You can see it's come away from the sides. I'm going to ease the central bit. And I think this is ready to be unmoulded. So, a bit of a grand operation this. I hold my breath. <sighs> ah, beautiful. And you wait because when it's had its dusting of icing sugar, the hills really will be alive. Bowls. Yeah. Um, really, you're going to have some of this. Thank you. Too much healthy wow. eating going on. Yeah. Espresso martini, so anyone? Oh, okay. Mm. What's in that? <laughs> well, espresso, anyway. Really, really strong stuff. Quite bitter. Some butterscotch schnapps. Or you can use toffee vodka, it doesn't matter. I think it's almost better not to know what goes in here. It tastes so delicious, but it feels bad when you say everything. Okay, coffee liqueur. And it, I feel slightly embarrassed pouring it in because it sounds like it's incredibly alcoholic and of course it is but it doesn't taste it. I like your minimal measures. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's only because I want it to be equal parts and of course it's a martini well, it started off in some vague form as a martini so this is just vodka vodka. straight up to the top. <laughs> <laughs> Look there's a lot of us. That's true. <laughs> then you can ice yourselves up. Thank you. Pass them round she said. 
That's very really nice. Mm. Isn't it really good? I think we should be it's like a big pickup, isn't it? Mm. It really is. Lovely. It's it does make you want to glug it. Like yeah, it's coffee. Yeah. It's like it's coffee. Okay, sit down, oh, sit down, down everyone. I'm going to I'm going to get some food to soak this up. Very good. Ah, oh, this is lovely. Puffy and golden. I love the way the little circles of bread become scorched and just infused with egg and cheese. It's like a toasted cheese sandwich, but a celestial one, as if eaten by angels. I'm going to snip a few chives on top, just to echo the spring onions that are inside. Now I think I'm going to rush it to the table when well, it's still hot. <laughs> Mind your backs, Ooh. it's very, very, very wow. hot. Okay. Wow, okay. Right. Onion strata. Shall I do you the first bit and you can take over? Well, I'm yeah, all I'll do yeah. is. Okay. It's like, oh, I think it's because it's layers. It's like a bread and butter pudding, only savoury. Good staple anti hangover stuff. Yes, I What's think. What's in it again? Cheese, mm. egg, bread. <laughs> it smells divine. Yeah. I mean, I'm That's afraid way. it is really addictive. <laughs> So on top of all those carbs, I've got you a cake, Maria. Mm. <laughs> I'm going to go get it. Let them eat cake. Thank you. Oh, She's in the angle over the cake. Now we can see it in its full seasonal splendour. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Now look oh, wow. at this. That's all I need, wow. after this, you see, I feel all I need is for Christopher Plummer to sing Able to me. And my Christmas will be perfect. <laughs> It's more pudding. Tasted. It's in a way more pudding than cake. This is really good. I'd quite like to have this with um, a cup of coffee in the morning. Maria, have some of this. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, John. This is how it's really delicious. Okay, dip it in the espresso martini. <laughs> <laughs> like lambs to slaughter. <laughs> No one ever goes hungry in my house, not a surprise anyway, least of all me. And I have to say, I do regard Christmas as a bit of an excuse for many special eating opportunities. If I know I've got the oven on any time at this time of year, I always sneak in a potato or two so that I can bake them in readiness for only the most delicious snack of the season, my fully loaded potato skins. potatoes baked until they're fairly crisp on the outside but fluffy on the inside. There are a few things I think is disappointing as an undercooked baked potato or a too cold bath. Now as soon as you can bear to cut them do so. I have asbestos hands so they are steaming. Scoop out that fluffy interior. Doesn't matter if some is left inside the potato skin and put those back on the tray, like boats ready to be charged up. The great thing about this light little snack is that it's so easy to do, and although I love it as a solitary delight, it's fantastic to wheel out when you've got a lot of people to feed and fill up.
And now, this is the joyous part, there are many additions. First, I want to spring onion, finely chopped, in a manner of speaking. I want some really strong cheese in next, either cheddar, good cheddar, or red Leicester, or whatever takes your fancy. On top of that, I want a good splodge of sour cream. That just helps everything meld together. And a splosh of Worcester sauce for tang. Only a little salt, don't need much. But quite a good grinding of pepper. And this gorgeous mixture just needs to be forked together. Now there is absolutely nothing wrong with a plain baked potato with butter melting through it. But you know, this is the season of excess. Now my empty vessels are ready to be loaded. I don't have any guilty pleasures because I don't think that pleasure is something you should ever feel guilty about. But these are absolutely my guiltless pleasures. They really are bulging. A bit more cheese on top. And into the oven to ooze and melt and warm through. Oh, how they call to me. I'm gonna risk the heat, my greed. Now there is no hardship eating them like this, but to be fully loaded, need bacon and I did snapple some off the table at brunch. Crumble that over. Mm. The fully loaded potato skin. My Christmas treat. There's a dark soul hiding underneath your skin. 